I'm, I don't want to get too gross here, but folks, in Bible times, these blind people's eyes were crusted and matted and ugly. And when you and I can't see, Jesus puts his hands on our eyes. And when he takes them away, we see better than men as trees walking, don't we? Oh, the fellow that was deaf. Jesus comes and the Bible says he took his hands and put his fingers in there in his ears. And when he moved them, the man could hear. So often, you and I don't want to hear from God, and Jesus says, come on, let me put my fingers in there so that you can hear. Aren't you glad he helps us hear? Oh, sometimes the old preacher prays this way. I, t- I tell you, I do. Sometimes I don't think I speak very clearly, and sometimes I get tongue-tied. And I pray, Lord, can you just touch my tongue and help me speak just one more time? Just one more time. That's all I'm asking for. The Lord's been pretty gracious I've been here over 13 years now, all right? Somebody must have broken a mirror 13 years, bad luck, all right? Not at all, all right? But, but sometimes I'll just say, Lord, I, uh, I don't know, something's not working right. Will you just take that finger like you did in Bible times and just place it on my tongue so it would move better? Aren't you glad when you don't know what to say, the Lord comes along and touches your tongue so that you can speak to somebody and it comes out as if an angel were saying it? Oh, my goodness. This is Jesus that we have now. Can you picture this? Please picture this. That in the streets of Jerusalem one day, here comes a casket, and a young boy was in that casket. And, and the mother, who was a widow, had no husband, was following and weeping, and Jesus comes up and touches the, ta- the casket with that hand and raises that little boy. Jesus, knowing that that widow woman was going to need a young man to make a living for her someday and keep her safe. Aren't you glad that at funerals, Jesus comes by with the touch of his hand? And he may not raise people out of caskets today, but boy, he can touch your heart, can he? All right? Can you picture this, Lazarus uh, in the grave? And Mary and Martha says, Jesus, man, if you'd have just been here a day before, If you'd have just been here a couple of days when he was sick and Jesus just holds his hand up and says, no, 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 you don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believeth in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And he raises that hand. There's not a sickle in it today. But he raises that hand and he speaks, Lazarus, come forth. And here he comes. He had to be undressed from the mummy clothes he had on, right? You see, Jesus' hand is not holding that sickle yet. He's reaching down in the water. He's touching caskets. He's raising people from the dead. He's healing the tongue and the ears and the eyes and the skin of lepers. I picture him sometimes, especially when we have communion. I, the preacher has a decent imagination here, you know. And sometimes I picture Jesus, not me back here, but Jesus here, taking the bread and literally breaking it and passing it. The two that were on the road to Emmaus, Jesus came to speak to them, and they walked to Emmaus. And they insisted that he stay. He was going to go on, but no, 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 they insisted, please come in, stay with us, it's dark. So they sit down at the table, and the Bible says that when he broke bread and prayed, they then recognized him. You see, today, his hands are breaking bread. Uh, His hands are passing the cup to you. There's not a sickle in it yet. Thank God, right? But in this day, when, when John sees this vision, unfortunately, there is no healing in his wings. There is no touching the blind anymore. There's no deaf now hearing. There's no comfort in those hands. He is now a combine. You and I might think, oh, how cruel. How many times, though? How many times does a, a person hear the knock of Jesus on their heart's door? Yesterday with the boys and Jacob and Nick, an old fellow that has beagles, uh, I, I saw him. I didn't recognize him, but he recognized me. And uh, 
I said, well, I always invite you to come to our church. He says, yeah, you've done it two or three years in a row now. And I said, what's wrong with you? (laughs) He says, the phone is ringing. I'm just not answering yet. Ooh. How many times does Jesus come and knock on our heart's door and beg entrance, but he can't open the door? He can't pry it open. We've got to open it. And now all of a sudden, in the eternal history of heaven and earth, Jesus now does not have bread. He is not reaching to pull someone out of the water. He's not healing anybody, but he has a sickle in his hands. And you and I think, ah, no, that can't be. Well, yeah, it can be. You remember one day when Jesus walked into Jerusalem for the last time? It was the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. And right after he came into Jerusalem, he went to the temple. And what did he see? They were exchanging money and selling, making profit. What did Jesus do? Did he he, uh, touch anybody there? Ah, He made a whip. He started cracking that whip, and he cleared the temple. He said, you have made it a den of thieves, but this is to be a house of prayer for all nations. This is my father's house. Hey, we've seen him angry before. This time, the anger is all over the place. With that sickle in his hands, the harvest is now ready. In verse 15, I I just want you to take a look at this, please. Uh, I want you to think about it for a moment. But the Bible says in verse 15, another angel. I told you last Sunday that every time we see an angel in this portion of the book of Revelation, the scenes get uglier. They're more disastrous results. They're more intense. And this angel leaves the temple and is dispatched to one and only one. The one that needs to hear the news, hot off the press, he goes directly to Jesus Christ. And he says, the harvest is ready, thrust in your sickle. Now you might need to think about this for a moment, but why is that angel necessary? Jesus is on the white cloud, he's got a sickle in his hand. Why is it that the angel had to come and tell Jesus it was time? I want to pull something out of the scripture that maybe you haven't thought for a while, but in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, we read this. The disciples are there with him at the temple, and Jesus is explaining the end of the world, the end of things. Read it. Matthew chapter 24, it's exciting. Many, many, many things have already been taking place. Jesus might be right there on that white cloud right over there. You and I don't know that yet, do we? He could be coming any moment now. And the angel comes to him and gives him the news that it is now time. But in Matthew chapter 24, when the disciple says, Tell us, uh, when is this going to happen? Show us on the calendar. Uh, uh, Here, here's my watch. Show me what time on that day it will happen. And Jesus said, Whoa, wait a minute. Only the Father knows. Not even the Son of Man knows. And so now all of a sudden we realize that what Jesus said is true. That even on the white cloud, he may not know. And the news is dispatched from heaven by an angel who tells him, now it's time. Now, there's another side of this. Because Jesus said, no one knows but the Father. But there may be another side of this. And I want to say this, that maybe the angel came. Maybe Jesus did know. But maybe the angel had to urge him to pick up the sickle now and thrust it in, the harvest is ready. You see, because the Jesus I think of on that that throne is not only praying for you and I, but what do you think he's thinking about in our day and age? When a gunman walks into a synagogue and starts mowing people down, or in Louisville, Kentucky, somebody wants to try to get into an African-American church and can't and goes to a Kroger's and starts shooting people. That happened yesterday, didn't it? Or this week? Yeah? And people uh, take PVC pipe and pack it full of explosives and mails it and mails it to people. What do you think he's doing right now? Man, he's praying. He's praying that these, can I say, idiots would come to know him as Lord and Savior? 
I think the angel comes to urge Jesus, it's time now. I wonder if in Jesus' mind, he might want to say, oh, oh, not yet, not yet. That person is so close. Uh, Randall out there is just about ready to answer the phone. Not yet. But the angel urges him, no, no, this news comes from your father. This news comes from temp- the temple in heaven. The father says it's time. Pick up your, cycle, your sickle and, and thrust it in. He urges him. And all of a sudden, the prayers of the saints that have been hidden underneath the altar That's where the other angel in verse 17 comes from, verse 18 comes from. But now all of a sudden those prayers of the tribulation saints, those who've been saved during the tribulation, are now being answered because they've said, how long, Lord, how long? And now it's happening. That sickle is sharp. It's thrust into the harvest. The earth was reaped. No more opportunities. When I wrote that in my little notebook, I said, am I I sure? No more opportunities. I scanned through the rest of the book of Revelation. There might be a hint once or twice more that there's opportunities for people to be saved. But folks, the more time that passes, the fewer opportunities there are. In verse 17 and verse 18, we see more angels appearing and You know what? You might say, boy, how many angels are there up there? The book of Ezekiel as well as the book of Revelation says that there are thousand times thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. The Lord doesn't have a number on these. And then in verse 18, this angel in particular comes from under the altar where the tribulation saints have been tucked away. And then it says that he has power over the fire. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. That seems so out of place. Can I tell you something? There's nothing contradictory or out of place in the Bible. Uh, Can I say it one more time? There's nothing contradictory or out of place in the Bible. And this angel has power over the fire. How come? Why? Well, I want to remind you of a story, a parable that Jesus taught. He said that there was a harvest and the sower went out and the wheat was growing, but his enemy took tares and sowed them into the wheat. Weeds, useless, useless stuff. And, and, and the, the master was asked by the servants, do you want us to go and pull the tares out? And he said, no, you're going to damage the wheat. Just wait for the harvest. And the Bible says that when the harvest took place, they took the tares and did what with them? threw them into the fire. You see, at harvest time, a fire was necessary because that's, what you, that's where you put the stuff that wasn't part of the harvest, part of the fruit, part of the grain. There's a fire here. And those who are not part of the wheat and what God sowed, well, it's thrown into the fire. We see it again. In the Old Testament, we see that in verse 18, that he also speaks of the vine, um, the clusters of the vine. Do you see it there in verse 18? Let me share with you that in the Old Testament, Israel was compared to the vine. Uh, In the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you, you shall have fruit. Stay attached to Jesus. He's the vine in John chapter 15. In Romans, Paul says that we are grafted as Gentiles into the vine because the Jews weren't producing the fruit and they were lopped off. And here it is, the vine of the earth. And let me help you understand the specificity of this. I know that didn't come out right. Uh, The specifics of this, the vine of the earth. This reminds us of that tares and wheat parable that this is the vine of the earth. As much as Jesus is the vine, he's not the vine of the earth, he's the vine of God. And if we abide in him, we produce a different kind of fruit, but this is the vine of the earth. This is the fruit of the Antichrist, and it is fully ripe. It's time. In verse 19, it says that that those were thrown into the great wine press of